Hello and welcome to CPH session 19, Inferential Statistics, Making Comparisons and Conclusions from Data. This is part E, t-tests, comparing means. In this section, we'll look first at some examples of statistical tests and their resulting test statistics. There's many tests that we can use to generate different test statistics. In part E, we're focusing only on the t-test. In fact, there are many variations even of the t-test depending on our situation. So then we'll learn how to correctly choose the right t-test. And finally I'll take you through the general process of executing a t-test. So in part D I had showed you how we sometimes want to test whether or not a hypothesis is likely or not. And to do that we usually use a statistical test. And like I said at that time, there are many different statistical tests. In this table, I've listed some of the statistical tests that we might use. Uh, there are t-tests, uh, chi-squared, one-way ANOVA, Mann-Whitney, um, and also Fisher's exact test, just to name a few. And throughout this uh, lecture, I'll discuss each one of these at some point. However, these aren't all of the statistical tests that are available. Uh, but they are the most common. First, I want to point out some nomenclature associated with statistical tests as well. The first three tests that I've listed here are classified as parametric tests. Parametric tests have a bigger list of required assumptions, and they assume that your data follows a specific distribution, uh, which is usually the normal distribution. Uh, Non-parametric tests, on the other hand, such as the fourth one here, don't assume that your data follow any specific distribution. In other words, we're freed from one of those assumptions and it allows us to apply a non-parametric test in a situation that might not meet the more stringent assumptions that are required of parametric tests. And finally, we have exact tests. In basic inferential statistics, uh, Fisher's exact test is really the only test that uses this approach, uh, but there are other more complex uh, exact tests out there in, in inferential statistics. When we say exact, what we mean is we don't compute any test statistic. Notice there's no test statistic listed in the column there for the Fisher's exact. And we don't estimate p-value from our test statistic. Instead, we actually compute the exact probability of our data that occurs under our assumed conditions, uh, just like in the example that I showed you of the lady drinking tea. As you can imagine, we can only compute exact probabilities in cases where the possible outcomes are relatively limited, um, and usually a smaller sample size. As the possibilities in the sample size increase, it becomes computationally burdensome to compute the exact probability, and in that case, we're probably better off using a parametric test. Let's start by looking at the t-test. Um, the t-test is used to compare two means. So as such, that means we can only use the t-test when we have continuous data. If your data is categorical or binary, then you can't compute a mean summary statistic, and we need to use a different statistical test to make those comparisons. And you'll see some of that in part H. Now, we can choose from one of three different t-tests that are available. The first and the simplest is the one sample t-test. We use a one-sample t-test to try to determine whether our sample uh, of observations could have come from a population with a specific mean. In other words, we assume the mean of the population is equal to some value. Then we test how likely is it that our sample came from a population that has a mean value that we assumed. And I'll give you an example of that in the next slide. The next two types of t-tests are for when you have two samples. We have the independent and the dependent t-tests. Sometimes we call them the unpaired and the paired t-tests as well. In either case, we're making comparisons of the mean from two different samples. However, whether or not those two groups are mutually exclusive dictates which one we choose. For example, men and women would be mutually exclusive groups. You're either one or the other. So if you compared an anxiety score in men and a same score of anxiety in women, we would use the independent t-test. 
However, on the other hand, if we gave a pre and post test, uh, testing knowledge, um, see if it increased from an education intervention, in that case, we would be comparing the score after the intervention compared to the before the intervention within the same group of people. And so those are not mutually exclusive groups, and we would use a paired or dependent t-test. And we'll talk more about those two sample t-tests in later parts of the lecture. So I can summarize for you. Once we've decided that we want to use a, that we want to compare means, we decide we might want to use a t-test. And among the t-tests, there's three different ones to choose from. If you have one sample group to compare against a single value, we use the one sample t-test. If we want to compare the same variable between two groups, and those groups are mutually exclusive, then we use a two sample independent t-test. And finally, if we want to compare the same variable between two related groups, then we would use the two sample paired t-test. So just in case choosing from three different t-tests wasn't enough choices from you, for each of those t-tests, we have to choose also between the one-tailed and the two-tailed version of it. Uh, so this here uh, in the picture uh, is one of my cats. His name is Fritz. Um, so I chose the one-tailed version of him. Uh, could you imagine if I had chosen the two-tailed version? Anyway, in cats, we, we usually choose the, the one-tailed version. Um, but in statistics, your choice of one or two tails depends on what your alternative hypothesis is. So if you make your alternative hypothesis directional, then you would use a one-tailed t-test. If your alternative hypothesis, on the other hand, is non-directional, then you would want to use the two-tailed t-test. I can give you an example. Let's assume that we randomly ass uh, sample people from a database of uh, people going to a weight loss clinic. I'm sampling from this group and I measure their weight. Um, and I, I'm sampling from this group because I'm curious if people in this group are heavier than the average weight of the overall population. In other words, are people that go to a weight loss clinic heavier than the general population? So the first thing that I do is I assume a population mean weight. And I look at previous studies and I assume that the overall population mean weight is 52 kilograms. No matter what, my null hypothesis is that the mean weight of all people who go to a weight loss clinic is equal to the national average of 52 kilograms. However, in my case, uh, I'm interested if they're heavier. So my alternative hypothesis would be that the mean weight of those people is greater than 52 kilograms. And this is an example of a directional alternative hypothesis. I'm interested specifically if people are heavier. So I would use a one-tailed, one-sample t-test. Uh, I did not sample from non-weight loss clinic people, so I don't have two different samples to compare. I'm only comparing my sample to an assumed population value, and that's why I use the one sample t-test. On the other hand, if my question had been, is the weight of people at the clinic different, that is either heavier or lighter, then in that case, my alternative hypothesis is non-directional, and I would use a two-tailed one sample t-test. Okay. If we want to use a t-test, we have to meet a few assumptions first. If we don't meet these assumptions, our results could be inaccurate. So like I said earlier, t-tests are what's called parametric tests. That means they inherently assume that the data follows some underlying distribution function. In the case of t-tests, they assume that the sampling variability is normally distributed. If you remember, from the central limit theorem, it states that as long as our sample size is large, our sampling variability will be normally distributed. Therefore, if our sample size is big enough, we should be good. Uh, if we're over that 30 or 60 uh, participant threshold. 
However, if our sample size is small, we're going to want to check the normality of the data itself. Because if the data itself is normally distributed, then we can assume that the sampling variability is also normally distributed in the cases of small sample sizes. You can check for normality visually by plotting a histogram of your data. And you can also quantify the normality by computing z-scores for uh, summary statistics about normality and shape of the data, uh, which we call skewness and kurtosis. The second assumption that applies to all t-tests is that the data is of the type interval. If you remember from types of data, what that means is that, let's say if we're talking about a satisfaction scale, for example, and, and the increase of satisfaction uh, that from 2 to 3 on our scale is the same amount of increase as, it, as from 3 to 4. Um, now, ratio data has the same cr characteristic uh, as, as the interval data, just with the added feature that 0 means 0 of that measure that you're measuring. Uh, and so in, if your data is also continuous ratio, um, that would be okay too. And these assumptions, uh, they have to be met for any t-test. In later sections, we'll see that for the independent t-test, there's some even more required assumptions specifically related to that type of t-test. All right, so let's look at the actual procedure of doing the t-test. First, we have to determine the type of the t-test that we want to use based on what kind of sample we have. I mean, choose from the options that I gave you already. So we have to choose one of those three types, whether it's one or two tailed, uh, and then we can state our null and alternative hypotheses. Second thing we do is we assemble our data set and check for assumptions. Sometimes we have to manipulate our data first. And that's what I mean by manipulate, to, to get into a form that we can apply our t-test. And uh, the other thing we have to do is check for the assumptions. If we don't meet the assumptions, we need to stop. Thing, third thing we do is execute the t-test. Uh, we calculate what's called a t-statistic. Um, if t is large, what that means is our statistical model, the one we assumed, it explains more of the variance that we've observed uh, than the variance that we would expect from sampling variability alone. The fourth thing we do, uh, we, or our statistics program, use that t-statistic to compute a p-value. Um, we can compare that p-value to our chosen significance level then. And finally, the last thing we do is we either accept or reject the null hypothesis. And so that's it for part E. In part F, I'll take you through the specifics of the paired t-test.